Good morning. It's great to see you all here. Today we're in part two of the message that we began last week about calling. And this morning we're going to focus more on the how. How do we discern what God is calling us to? How do we take those first steps or next steps in living it out? Now, both of these hows focus more on the outward expression of our calling, the things that other people can see, the things that we're actually doing. But I don't want us to forget what we talked about last week, which, um, and last week we basically looked at how there are three components of Christian calling. There's the foundation, and then there's the motivation, and then there's the expression. And what we talked about is that of these three components, the foundation and the motivation of Christian calling are actually the most essential. So I want to start off just by giving a quick summary <clears throat> of what we talked about last week where we spent time just trying to deeply understand the foundation and motivation of calling. So last week, we, the first passage that we looked at was Luke chapter 3, verses 21 to 23. We looked at Jesus' baptism. And in this passage, we saw in Jesus' baptism the foundation of Christian calling, which is captured in this truth, that our value and our identity come from the unconditional love of God and that occurs before we do any outward action. So in Jesus' baptism, we saw that before Jesus did a single miracle, before he preached a single sermon, before he started his public ministry at all, God spoke to him and said, You are my son whom I love, and with you I am well pleased. And so we looked at how this foundation of Christian calling is essential for us to recognize that before we pursue anything outward, before we get caught up in trying to fulfill our calling, we need to hear these same words of God and to recognize that they apply to us yes. as well. Amen. And then we looked at a second passage, Luke chapter 4, verses 1 to 13, where we saw the motivation of Christian calling. And so if we um, take hold like Jesus did of that amazing truth that our value and our identity come from God's unconditional love, then we can respond by loving God in return. And when we love God, our motivation will be to seek first God's kingdom rather than trying to build our own, rather than trying to earn our own value and establish our own identity. So as we looked at Jesus being tempted and tested in the wilderness, we looked at how foundation and motivation go hand in hand. They both need to be there, and both are crucial before we start to express or to fulfill our outward calling. So one of the most practical illustrations that I can provide about how this applies to real life is the process that I go through each and every time I stand here to teach. Every time I'm working to prepare a message, I have the choice to either recognize that my value and my identity come from God's unconditional love before I utter a single word. Or I can give in to the temptation to try to earn value and establish an identity through my teaching. <clears throat> now, if I'm secure in the love of God, then I'm able to stand here with freedom and with joy, simply seeking to serve God as best as I can and to help other people to experience the, the presence and the love of God in their lives. If I've given into the temptation to measure my value or try to establish an identity through what I do and whether you all like me, then speaking is filled with anxiety and fear of failure and judgment. And then my true motivation is actually to seek first what's best for me rather than seek first God's kingdom. So we have this choice, all of us do, and we live this out every day of our lives. And even though the rest of this message is going to be focused a lot on how to discern our calling and the outward facets of our calling, we need to keep in mind that our calling is measured not just by the outward expression, but most importantly, by our inward foundation and our motivation. Amen. Right? Amen. 
So with that being hopefully unmistakably said, let's turn our attention to the passage that we'll be looking at today, which comes from Luke chapter 10. And we've been in Luke through this whole series. We're going to be continuing in Luke today. And I invite you to stand with me if you're able to honor the reading of God's word. And we're just going to read a short passage from Luke, which is verse 25 to 28. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. You may be seated. So this passage is Luke's version of Jesus' teaching of what's often called the great commandment. And uh, the great commandment to love God with all of our heart and all of our soul and all of our strength and all of our mind. And then it comes right along with what's often called the second great commandment, to love our neighbor as ourselves. And this teaching is also found in Matthew and Mark with slight variations. In Matthew and Mark, we have this teaching coming from Jesus teaching it. And here in Luke, we see that this teacher of the law is speaking it and Jesus is affirming it. Now, what stands out about these verses is that there are only a few places in scripture where the entirety of the Old Testament law is summarized. And this is one of them. And some of us may have a little bit of a negative reaction when we hear the word law, but the best way to understand the law in the Old Testament is that the law was designed to bring the people of God into relationship with God and to help them to live the way that God wanted them to live. And so it's significant that when Jesus summarizes the entire law, he doesn't use a negative command like do not murder or do not steal or don't be evil. But he uses a positive command, the full expression of what it means to live life as God intended is encapsulated in these words, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength and all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. So everything that we do, including how we think about our calling is designed to fit within this teaching. So the purpose of this message is to be as practical as possible, and I'm going to use this framework. Hopefully, it's easy for us to remember because this is perhaps a familiar verse or a verse that we'd want to hold on to. But these, these facets, heart, soul, strength, and mind, and then neighbor as a framework for how we can process and discern our calling. Okay, so this is going to be a bit of content, and I thought long and hard about the best way not just to present the content, but also to illustrate how it applies to our lives. And as we go through each facet um, of this teaching, we're going to look also at a story. This is going to be the story of Linda and her husband, Emil. Linda and Emil are partners at New Beginnings. And I first met Linda because she volunteers administratively with us. She helps us each week with our uh, weekly communications. And I didn't really know anything else about her until one day I asked her, you know, Linda, is there any way that I can be praying for you? And her response surprised me and encouraged me because she started letting me know about how she and Emil are foster parents. And they're not only, they don't, they don't only connect with the foster child, but they make an extraordinary effort to connect with the biological family, which is often somewhat unique because there's often some level of tension between the foster family and the biological family. And God has opened doors for her to have tremendous relationships with these biological families. She had, she's had chances to pray for them. She's seeing God work in their lives. And so her prayer request was that God would continue to do more and provide breakthroughs for these families that she is ministering to and working with. And it struck me, and I know that this is true, that Linda and Emile's life is just one of the examples of all sorts of vibrant and unsung stories of people in this community, in new beginnings, who are faithfully living their calling, they are faithfully pursuing 
God and what God is asking them to do in ways that are often hidden, but are making an incredible difference in transforming this world. So as we talk about this framework for discerning calling, we're also going to reflect on Linda and Emile's story and how their process of becoming foster parents reflects this calling, how it's applied to their lives. Okay, so let's start at the beginning with the facet of heart. Simply put, our heart's desires matter to God. Once we've established our foundation in God's love, our motivation is to seek first God's kingdom, then, our, then the desires of our heart are a critical component to understanding what God wants us to do, what he's calling us to do. And specifically, I'd ask us to think about two questions as it relates to heart. First, what makes our hearts rejoice? And the second is what makes our hearts break? So what makes our hearts rejoice? I was thinking of another way to ask this question, and I think the way that I would frame it is, if you had a chunk of, of, of time, time that was all yours, and you didn't have any financial obligations that were tied to this time, you didn't have any financial worries, and... You didn't have to think about how anyone else wanted you to spend this time. You didn't have to impress anyone else. Or, you, know, you didn't have to please anyone else. What would you naturally and joyfully do with this time just because of the way that God has made you? Now, I know some people, things instantly start coming to mind. Pastor Dan Monroe loves to paint. He'll work on a painting for hours and over weeks. There may be other people that are passionate about a particular sport. Some people here, you know, might spend time coding. Some people here might spend time building houses, right? They're, they're different passions and joys of our heart that we love to do. Now, I was thinking that there may be other people here who have a really hard time answering this question. Yeah, actually, there may be people here who have a really hard time even imagining the possibility of this question being asked, of like, you know, Tons of free time and no financial obligation and no need to impress anyone. Like, what does that even look like? That kind of looks like maybe what will happen when I die, right? Tons of free time, no financial obligations, no one to impress. Um, and I actually, it took me quite a bit of time to think, you know, I don't, I don't know. I have two young kids and work. What does that even look like? And I would just encourage, if you have a hard time answering this question, that's okay. But I would suggest that it's worthy of spending some time thinking about. Yes. Because this is part of the way that God has created us to be. The, the things that our, our hearts naturally gravitate toward are things that are designed to bring us joy, to energize us, to renew us. And they're often ways that we express a part of God's beauty, God's love, the, the, um, the, the dynamic of God's creation, and that we help to share that with other people. So we're probably missing out on something if we can't answer this question, and it's just worthy of thinking about. Okay, the second aspect of discerning our calling through our hearts is knowing what makes our hearts break. And this simply reflects the fact that God created our hearts to be sensitive to issues of justice and mercy and compassion. And our hearts long to participate with God in redeeming this world and making things right. Yes, yes. So where does your heart break? Where do you sense the brokenness and the effects of sin in this world and you long to participate in helping to fix them? Yes. You moved to do something about it. So for Linda and Emil, one of their heart's desires, one of their great loves, has always been a delight in spending time with children. And as they raised their own kids, uh, Linda was very involved, and she actually um, got, uh, took on a role in coaching her kids' travel soccer team. And one season, uh, one of the girls on that team became homeless in the middle of the season, and she had to enter into the foster care system. Now, because the team was a traveling team, Linda was the coach, she had to work with the social workers to make sure that the travel arrangements were okay, that this girl was legally allowed to be taken out of the county. And as Linda saw the emotional trauma that was involved in becoming homeless, 
and all the dynamics that were going on with the family that caused this trauma, the difficulty of entering into the foster care system, Linda developed a deep sense of compassion for this young eight-year-old girl. And it was this process of becoming exposed to the foster care system and having a first-hand experience of the family trauma that causes kids to need foster care that gave Linda a tangible burden for kids in need. And it was, this is what led her to consider becoming a foster parent. So this story gives us both sides. It, it's an expression of what makes Linda's heart rejoice, that time spent with kids, loving them, caring for them, and also what made her heart break, yeah. seeing the trauma of this little girl's life as her family fell apart. So that's the facet of heart. What makes our hearts rejoice and what makes our hearts break? So the next aspect of discerning our calling that I want to look at is represented in the word soul. And when we think of soul, which we can consider as our full sense of self that's designed to commune with God, we can think about the importance of prayer and asking God for his leading in our lives. So even the fact that we use the term calling reflects the truth that there is one who calls. There's a caller. And if there's one thing that the Bible makes clear from beginning to end, it's that God is a God who wants to communicate. He wants to be known. He wants to reveal himself and his purpose. Yes. So it's first and foremost God's responsibility to communicate to us about our calling. And one of the primary ways that he speaks to us and lets us know is through prayer. Now when we pray about our calling, we're not just asking for some miraculous confirmation, right? As if, um, you know, as if it's mission impossible and we're there praying and we're expecting God to provide some kind of source of information, either a piece of paper or this hologram of Jesus that says, your mission, if you choose to accept it, is, and then we'll know what our calling is, right? Yeah, th <laughs> that may happen occasionally for some people, but that's not usually what happens in prayer. Instead, prayer is one of the ways that we talk to God about our calling. It's actually one of the ways that we integrate all of the pieces. So everything that we talk about this morning, the things that we learn from our heart, and the things that we learn from our strength and our mind and our neighbors, all of that integrates together and we wrestle with it and it mixes together in prayer. And God refines and clarifies what he's calling us to. So one of the realizations that I had in preparing last week's message and this week's message is that when we look at that period of time between Jesus' baptism, that passage we looked at in Luke 3, and that time when Jesus starts his public ministry in the middle of Luke 4, that is a time of prayer. You know, a lot of times we, maybe we see kind of the title in, uh, in our Bibles and we think, you know, Jesus tempted in the desert or in the wilderness. And we read it and we see this dynamic between, you know, Jesus being challenged by the devil. And we think it's some kind of showdown in the desert, right? Or maybe we think of it as some kind of like spiritual SAT test. And the devil is the proctor and Jesus has to pass this test in order to be allowed to move forward in his calling. But I don't think that's what's happening at all. That 40 days in the desert, in the wilderness, is nothing more or less than a season of prayer. It's in the context of prayer that he struggled with his temptations, where he struggled with the devil. And he was wrestling with whether he could truly trust the words that he had heard at his baptism. It's in prayer that Jesus was trying to figure out what God was calling him to, what it would look like, and whether he would be able to trust God to fulfill it. It was in prayer that God was clarifying and refining the call that he had placed on Jesus' life. It's in prayer that we can be honest with God and honest with ourselves about our fears and our doubts and our struggles. And that's where we get a sense of what the next step of our calling is. So my question to us is, is that how we pray? You know, when we pray about our calling, are we just waiting for that crystal clear answer? 
Or are we struggling and wrestling with honesty about what God might be leading us to? So for Linda and Emil, prayer was actually a huge part of how God led them to become foster parents. Linda, because of the burden of her heart that she carried from her interactions and her caring for her daughter's teammate, felt called to become a foster parent first. But her husband, Emil, wasn't as ready. So Emil at one point decides that you know, he and Linda um, have basically finished having biological kids. They're ready to move past that season. And it was at that moment that Linda goes, well, Emil, what do you think about becoming foster parents? And Emil goes, no. Maybe he went, no way. You know, uh, um, and so Linda didn't bring it up with Emil again, but she began to pray. And she prayed about her own heart to become a foster parent. She prayed for Emil's heart. And she prayed consistently over an extended period of time. And after two years, there came a day when Emil initiated a conversation with Linda and said, you know what, Linda, I think I'm ready to start looking into what foster parenting would look like. And all through that time, God had been working with Emil in Emil's own prayers, his motivations, his fears, his sense of calling. And that's the power of prayer. That's where we're honest with God, where we wrestle with our fears and our doubts, and we find the courage to move forward with our calling. So we're moving through the framework given by the great commandment to love the Lord our God with all of our heart and soul and strength and mind. And so now the third facet of discerning our calling is represented in the word strength. So when we think about strength, we think about our abilities, our natural, our spiritual gifts, the things that we can do, the things that we are good at, that God has blessed us with, that we can invest in making an impact in this world. And the reality is when many of us think about our calling, we often start with our strengths because those are places that we have confidence that we can make a difference. But I want to suggest that considering our strengths should really be something that occurs after we've thought about how God is moving on our hearts, how God makes our hearts rejoice or the burdens that he places on our hearts where our hearts break. Because the danger of starting with our strengths is that often we leave God out of the picture or we minimize God's role because those are the things that we feel like we can do ourselves. And instead, if we begin with our hearts and where we are burdened by the needs of others, then God often has a way of empowering us with strengths that we may not even have known that we were capable of. So we definitely should consider our strengths because they're part of how God has made us. They're part of how we engage with the world. But we should also remember that God does not merely call those who are qualified but he also qualifies those who are called. God does not merely call the qualified, but he qualifies those who are called. So we should be aware of our strengths, and we should ask God to allow us to use our strengths and and gifts in the context of our calling, but we should always recognize that our ultimate dependence is on God's provision and power. And he can surprise us in many ways. He can surprise us with strengths that we didn't know we had. He can surprise us by bringing other people around us to supplement our strengths in ways that we would never expect. So this was surely true for Linda and Emil. Linda and Emil have plenty of gifts that are relevant to their calling. They have the experience of parenting their own children. They're blessed by Emil's career and Linda's time availability to provide the kind of stability and supportive environment that is ideal for uh, foster parenting. But they would also say that the they would also be the first to say that the challenge of foster parenting wasn't anything that they could have done based on their own abilities. As foster parents, they use all of their gifts, but they also desperately depend on God's empowerment to make a difference in the lives of the kids and the families that they work with. When they're depending on God for a breakthrough to develop trust and intimacy and care 
for a child. That's something that only God can provide. So the fourth facet of discerning our calling is represented in the word mind. And our mind is what helps us to see the big picture. It helps us to see our context and our history. You know, one of the most important aspects of discerning our calling is to know that God doesn't waste anything in our lives. So our, our joys and our sorrows, our successes and our failures, our desire to do good and our struggles and disappointments, even with ourselves, all of them are part of who we are. And God can use it all if we let him to help us to introduce other people to the love of God, to help us to fulfill our calling. So for Linda and Emil, there were parts of their life histories that pointed them in the direction of God's call to become foster parents. There were things in their lives that helped that direction to make sense. Emil re, um, recalled that one of the, real, the formative aspects of his life growing up was that he spent the first three years of his life being raised by his grandparents. And then he needed to move to Chicago to live with his parents. And that was an extremely traumatic transition for him. That experience gives him a unique sensitivity to kids trying to adjust to a foster family. And Linda and Emil care not only for uh, the foster children, but also for the biological family that the the child is coming from. And one of their uh, experiences is that Uh, one of the common challenges for those biological families is often drug abuse. And Linda realized that God had been preparing her because one of the challenges that she has faced in her family is dealing with drug addiction and the challenge of overcoming it. And so that has given her a unique empathy and ability to, um, to trust and to care for families who are going through the same thing. The parts of our lives that we regard as most broken or most shameful are often the exact ones that are eventually redeemed by God. And and God allows us to come alongside others who are dealing with the same things and for us to be able to share and testify of the ways that God's love and healing power can make a difference. It's often part of our call. And it's with our minds that we're able to see this big picture, that we're able to think through, what are the pieces of my life? What are the stories and experiences of my life? And how might they relate to the way that God is calling me? So the final facet of discerning our calling is represented in the word neighbor. We've talked about heart and soul and strength and mind. And now we're on that word neighbor, okay, that reflects from loving our neighbor as ourselves. And the first thing that I want to suggest is that we almost always make discerning our calling an individual exercise, but it doesn't have to be. So I just want to give an encouragement that if you're having difficulty discerning your calling, if you just don't know, you, you have a heart to move forward in your calling, but you just have a really hard sense of figuring out what that looks like. I just want to encourage you to seek out people that you trust. Seek out people who have the kind of relationship with God that you respect and that you would want to have as well. And ask them for their feedback and for their input. Dialogue with them about what God might be calling you to do. Now, the other principle that I want to highlight is that our calling is not just our own. And especially if we're married, our calling is often intertwined with our spouse's calling. And I want to particularly challenge the men on this because we so often come with the assumption that the husband has a calling and the wife just comes alongside that calling and helps him to fulfill it. But as I look at my responsibility as a husband to lay down my life for my wife, coming from Ephesians 5, I'm convinced that part of my responsibility is to do whatever I can to help her to fulfill the calling that God has placed on her life. And when we look at scripture, 
we see that the same gifts of the Spirit are poured out on men and women. We see examples of both men and women called to ministry and to leadership, both in the church and in the world. And so I need to love my wife and to support her in her calling in the same way that I'm concerned about my calling. Okay? After all, my wife is also my neighbor, and I need to love her as I love myself. So I want to return to Linda and Emil's story for one final point. We've seen how all these facets of heart and soul and strength and mind and neighbor showed up in Linda and Emil's sense of calling. They used their hearts to recognize their joy in caring for kids. Their hearts were broken for kids who were going through family trauma. They loved God with all their souls, spending time in prayer, wrestling with their fears and doubts, and getting God's sense of confirmation to move forward in foster parenting. They considered their strengths, and they knew that they had the basic resources and abilities to make this calling feasible. They used their minds and knew that the step of becoming foster parents made sense with their life stories and their histories and their family context, and it, it aligned with the direction that God had prepared them for. And then they recognized that the calling to foster parenting was more than an individual calling. It was, it was Emil honoring the calling that God had given to Linda and coming alongside her and sharing it with her. But for all that, they still needed to act. They needed to take the next step. For Linda and Emil, that next step meant contacting the county, signing up for an eight-week class, and getting approved as foster parents. For all their conviction of God's calling, it would have come to nothing unless they had taken that step of obedience to turn their conviction into action. Yeah. Yeah. You know, for many of us, that first step can be the hardest one. Change can be so hard for us because our lives are so full, so full of routine, so full of good intentions, that actually taking a step forward to something new can feel almost impossible. Yeah. You know, I was thinking about what this looked like actually when I was walking through my garage. And my garage is a total mess. A few years back, <laughs> I put a picture up. <laughs> a few years back, we moved our car out of the garage. It was probably a huge mistake. So ever since then, we had, you know, oh, for, since that point, we had space in our garage. And so our garage started to collect things. And they particularly started to collect things that were intentions, things that we intended to keep, things that we intended at some point to get rid of or to give to someone else, things that we intended to throw away, but they didn't fit in our garbage bin. This is kind of embarrassing. This is part of using everything in our lives for God's glory. God can redeem everything, right? But you can take that down because now it's bothering me. All right. <laughs> I had to get my wife's permission to be able to show that picture. Um, so our garage has gotten to the point, really, you can take it down. No, our garage has gotten to the point where I can't even walk from the front to the back or from one side to the other because all of these intentions are now piled up on each other. And I barely know what's in my garage. I can't use all the things that I intended to act on. You know, we generate good intentions here every Sunday. If we could see the intentions that come out of our worship and our prayer and our teaching, they would be piled up to the ceiling. And I know that a fair share of them would be my intentions, things that I felt like God was leading me to that I just never acted on. But we have a responsibility and an opportunity to turn an intention into action, to take that first step. Yes, 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 yes. So a lot of times we don't take that first step because we don't know how the full story is going to turn out. We're afraid of the unknown, of what it might lead to. Perhaps we're afraid of failure. Like, what if, it all, what if I fall on my face if I take that action? Maybe we're afraid of what our calling might cost us. We take that first step and we're not sure what kind of sacrifice might be asked of us. 
I shared earlier that it's God's responsibility to make our calling clear. But God almost never reveals the entire journey. He doesn't show us how everything will go, probably because if we saw everything, we wouldn't be able to handle it all at once. But God always shows us the next step. He invites us to take that first step of faith to pursue our calling. And sometimes we just need to start small. We can't change the world all at once. But we can look out for that one person in our lives that we can begin to love and start to make a difference. Start to share the love of God with that person. Psalm 37 Um, in the New Living Transition, reminds us of this. There are these two verses that just say, the Lord directs the steps of the godly. He delights in every detail of their lives. Though they stumble, they will never fall, for their Lord holds them by the hand. And the reality is when we take those first steps, we may stumble. We may not know what we're doing. We may make mistakes. We may feel like we're failing. But God is holding us by our hands. He's the one who's promised never to leave us or forsake us, to be with us at every step in that journey. God walks with us. And if we take one step of faith at a time, if we trust him, he will help us to fulfill our calling. So let me just ask you, is there one step of faith to fulfill your calling that God is calling you to take this morning. Um, Just really quick as I close, I just want to give a quick invitation. For some people here, that next step or first step may be connected to your relationship with God. You may never have made that commitment to say, I want to walk with Jesus. I want to follow Jesus, and I want to commit to him as my Lord and Savior. And that may have been something that has been working on your heart and your soul and your mind for a while. And you realize that God has brought you to the point where you're ready to take that step. And if that's you, I invite you to take your connection card out. And in that box where it says, I commit to become a new follower or rededicate my life to Jesus, I encourage you just to mark that box. And we would love to come alongside you and support you in that journey. And there may be others who are here that are wrestling with their calling. And as we've talked about these different facets of heart and soul and strength and mind and neighbor, maybe there are some pieces that have started to come together. Or there's a glimmer of maybe God is calling me in this direction. And I would encourage you, like sometimes we only figure out, we only have our calling clarified. We only know what the next step is after we've taken the first step. And so if you have that sense from God that he is encouraging you to take that first step in pursuing your calling, I want to encourage you just to write in that box that says um, response to the message, just write, I will step. And we would love as a staff, as a pastoral staff, to, be pr- to, to pray for you as you take that first step, that next step in pursuing your calling. Amen.